Hello and welcome um, to this podcast as we continue our walk through James. This is Pastor Titus Bilo and Pastor Gunnar Liederman hey. from across the United States. Happy to dig into God's Word, spend some time personally, but also, God willing, connect with some of you and give you a resource that can help you dig deeper into God's Word right at home where you're at. We are in the book of James and we have reached chapter 3. A couple of headings here are taming the tongue, two kinds of wisdom. Um, so as we dig into this, may the Lord bless our study of his wisdom. Go ahead, Gunnar. All right, we are in James chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 1 to 8, and then a short commentary on it. And then uh, me and Pastor Titus will dig into it. So it starts out... Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. Those are the verses and now the commentary. James was a great teacher of the faith, but perhaps he did not always think that the difficulty of his teaching work was respected. Perhaps teachers were not getting much respect because people thought, well, all they do is talk. It's not like they do any real physical work. Perhaps this sarcastic saying of today was believed back then. Those who can do, those who can't teach. Perhaps the idea was floating around that teaching, especially teaching in the church, which often receives lowly or non-existent monetary compensation, was easy, that anyone could do it, or that it was of no great importance. Not so, says James. Teaching in the church is not for everyone for two reasons. First, God holds those who work daily in the word to higher standards. To whom much has been given, from him shall much be expected. Second, controlling the tongue and using it wisely is neither simple nor easy. Controlling our mouths is not on the edges of Christian life, just one small detail among many minor matters, but it is the key to controlling the whole self. Someone who is careful with words and thus has learned to exercise self-control has earned the right to be listened to. He is perfect, not in the sense that he has never sinned, but in the sense that he has achieved an important goal set by God, and that control over the rest of his life will fall into place too. We need to respect the mighty power of the words we speak. Ah, talk is cheap, people say. Sticks and stones may break your bones, but words will never hurt you. A contraire, according to James. Although words seem to be merely moving air, although the tongue is just a three-inch muscle, wet, floppy, and only partially visible, it is tremendously powerful. Like a tail that wags the dog, the tongue drives our lives. James gives the following examples of little things that have big effects. The bit in a horse's mouth. That little piece of steel in a horse's mouth when managed properly, can control a 2,000-pound animal and the rudder on a ship. 
that little shaped plank, mostly invisible beneath the waterline, enables the captain to control the course of an immense ship filled with cargo, crew, passengers, or finally a spark in a forest. Under control, a spark can make a small fire to warm, hold travelers, cook food. Out of control, a spark can cause a conflagration. Uh, can cause and reduce thousands of acres of mighty trees to blackened, smoking stumps <clears throat> and destroy homes, people's lives, cause insurance rates to go up. It's horrible. James thinks it urgent that people learn to control their mouths, not only to avoid hurting other people emotionally and spiritually, but an uncontrolled tongue can also turn on the uncontrolled talker. Corrupting the whole person, poisoning his or her mind, and plunging the body into the dangers of the fires of hell. The tongue, of course, does not operate itself. What James is really getting at is that the brain that regulates the tongue, which here is another example of real faith for real life. People who claim to be believers must not let their mouths get out of control. Real faith in the Savior welcomes the power of the Spirit to bite back lies or sarcasm or ridicule or gossip or evil suggestions and praise for evil deeds. Real faith uses the Spirit's real power to build up other people, speak the truth, compliment, forgive, and comfort. Real faith also knows when to command the tongue to be silent. Talk is cheap, words, or talk is not cheap, and words do wound. Words can build up or destroy a person's self-confidence. Even one word, even just one time. Words can turn someone's proud achievement into humiliation. They can create or destroy relationships. They can spread hate or love. They can spread truth or plant lies. Words can cause suspicion or build trust. That's the end of the commentary portion. In this first section from James, it's very obvious. Like this is this is a warning, um, and in the next couple of verses, we'll see part of the reason for that. He's prefacing um, an objective that he wants to accomplish, uh, namely that he doesn't want there to be a contradiction between what we're saying and who we claim to be and that we're cursing and blessing at the same time. So he's about to get into that. But first, he's just like, let me just talk to you about the tongue here for a second. Like, this isn't just, oh, it's just words. It's not a big deal. Or, you know, I was just saying, my one son says it all the time. It drives me nuts. Just ask him, what does that mean? I'm just saying. Is that downplaying what you're saying? Or is it supposed to make me listen more? <laughs> I don't even think you know. And... So let's just eliminate those words. Um, but words are so powerful for good or for evil. On the good side, like I recently was at something where they had an affirming exercise where um, a bunch of guys spoke positive things about the other guys that they saw like at this event. And it was, uh, you know what did this person do well? And why do you think, you know, they are embodying some of these good characteristics? Tell them that was extremely powerful. I felt very affirmed. <laughs> I felt very encouraged by their words because it, it displayed, it told me what they thought. It wasn't me just wondering what they thought. So very powerful, but on the same token, um, if it's a negative word, or a careless word, or a, or a foolish word, like that can dig deep, that can destroy relationships, it can destroy institutions, it can destroy a person. And it very much, if, if you're constantly using language and an attitude, speaking negatively, speaking in a very anti-Christian way, don't pretend like that doesn't impact your soul. And that's what James is saying, like the tongue can steer your whole being. Uh, he compares it. Yeah, I I have a horse, um, and they are very intimidating. I mean, two thousand pound animal is not something you want to mess around with. But yet, it's amazing how kind they can be, 
and how trainable they are. We have that bit. And when I do ride her, put that bit in and that I can control this massive beast. And it's very humbling. If you ever had the chance to do it? It's, it's cool. Um, but I also think like if this animal decided that it didn't like me anymore, it could buck me off and I'd be dead. <laughs> but this tiny little bit gives me control over this animal because it's, you know, designed to control right from the tongue, right from the mouth, the entire, entire animal. And uh, I think of those big, just think of some of the massive like cruise ships, you know, like those things are huge. It's like a floating island. And yet I bet you that rudder is minuscule in comparison to how massive those things are. Um, and that's just amazing. That tiny little direction shift can move an entire barge. Now apply that to your tongue. You might say like, oh, well, yeah, I just said that a couple of times. Not a big deal. What James is saying is, is it is a big deal. You have to take it seriously. Be consistent with every single thing you say. Um, because even the smallest habits of speaking negatively, gossiping, and this can infect and hurt you and everybody around you. And I think the commentator did a good job saying like the tongue can, in, can infect the whole body, but not just the personal body. It can infect the whole body of believers in that area. I can't tell you how much one person, uh, or I can't tell you how often one person affected a whole meeting at church. You know, you got one person who's super negative or harsh or mean. Everyone leaves deflated. Everyone. Or like you have an idea and someone comes in with skepticism. That's not based in fact. It's not based in faith. It's based in just either frustration or opinion. And everyone is shut down. And the energy and the passion of all the other believers is, is dissipated instead of encouraged. Um and on the other side, like if someone came in with a very powerful word, a good word, how they could change that meeting for good. So it's just so true that the tongue is such a powerful tool for good or for evil. And uh, James has just given us a very big warning here in the first section. And it makes me think there, <clears throat> I forget where I had read it, but um you know i'm into mechanical things and uh all that kind of like engineering and things like that and I was reading years ago something about the aircraft carriers <clears throat> which like you said just like a cruise ship i mean their aircraft carriers are a city you know they have thousands of people on it they're self-sufficient they make food they have hospital you know they're ready to deploy to go to war and all this stuff. They can survive. And they said when they're like miles from the coast, they have to turn on <clears throat> their reverse engines because it's so big. It has so much momentum. Like that's how far out you need to stop to slow it down. Otherwise, it would just plow right into land because it's huge. But again, you have that tiny little rudder, right? That comparatively to size, weight, mass, whatever, is able to turn these huge things. And then in watching another um, probably documentary kind of a thing, they were talking about the Titanic. And they had mentioned, you know, if you're like me, which maybe not all of you are, but I, that kind of stuff fascinates me. Like, so with the Titanic, they had built it with all of these compartments where if you struck something, just that one compartment would fill up and the rest would be left. Now, the problem was they didn't carry it all the way up, uh, so they weren't sealed. And that's what happened is when they hit the iceberg, they struck it on the side and just one too many of those compartments filled up and because the ship started to sink, the water spilled over into the other compartments. That's why it sank. So they actually said it would have been better 
for them to have turned directly into the iceberg is then just maybe one or two of those front compartments would have gotten hit as opposed, which just seems counterintuitive as opposed to them trying to right. <laughs> too late and they scrape the side and too many compartments got open. But all that being said, <clears throat> the point is that that rudder is so powerful. And what's interesting then is, you know, we get how the, uh, sticks and stones and all like we all understand that words do actually have a tremendous amount of power and, and affect us right now that's a foolish that phrase um but even god so two of the commandments deal with words or really then like you said this affects the whole body this affects how everybody sees you and how god sees you so it's a lot of it is reputation then. Mm-hmm. And again, he's addressing at the beginning of this section, the idea of those who want to be teachers, which would be, you know, if you want to be at the highest level to know God's word so well, you can actually teach it to someone. If you're looking for that highest level of maturity, he talks about how your words are used. And so God protects words and his own reputation in the second commandment right? Don't misuse my name. But he also does it for us where you're not to, um, in the eighth commandment, right? Speak poor of other people. Like you need to protect their reputation. That's how you talk about them, uh, which really shows more about you. And so God is very serious about how we use our words with regards to him and with other people. And uh, like he said, if, if you're able to master that, you have reached a very rare level uh, in your life. And so, and two, growing up, right, it, like we had horses. And uh, like you said, it is amazing to see what that little, you know, basically it's a pen or pencil sized piece of metal inside of a horse's mouth that can steer it. And also where I grew up with, there were lots and lots of wildfires. And uh, a couple of times, even our own property was burnt up. Not the whole thing, but enough of it to scare you. And yeah, that one little spark, if not controlled, if not thought about, if you're not considering the landscape that you're in, it will just destroy. And it will continue to destroy. And getting control of it or unsaying things is near impossible and there's also those studies that have gone out about um, like how to create trust with people and you know it's something like you know if you say one positive thing that's great but if you say a negative thing i think it takes like seven or some seven ten whatever it is but if you say one negative thing you're gonna have to do tons of positives just to get back to having trust again with somebody and so you have all of these things you know all of these images from regular life that affirm what he's saying there that just even one word has tremendous power um in your life for the course of your life for your relationships your relationships with people with god And so to get to that point where you can control your tongue um, is a goal for every single Christian that shows maturity. So yeah, it's powerful. And that I think there's a misconception, like even of a lot of teachers that like when you become a teacher, you should be talking more. (laughs) I think some of the greatest masters, even if you think about like, even some movies about masters, um, yeah. they do a good job of portraying. It's often the silent wise one who's sitting there watching and then just, he says like three words that shatter your world. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, but that's, that can be very true of just reality in general. Like uh, don't use more words to cover up something. Be just be careful with your words. Realize they have such power. I mean, God created the world with words. Jesus is called the word. And words are powerful, 
even in the whole creation story and the whole scriptural story, like words are the center. That's where God's power comes from. He speaks life into us. So it's just amazing to think about the power of God's words. And then obviously the power that we have too. Yeah. One comment I had written down while we were reading the commentary is that when I do pre-marriage counseling, one of the things I say to those young couples is be very careful what you say when you're heated and when you're angry, mm. because studies show that you can't take your words back. And even if they forgive you, they probably won't forget it. Right. Which is just a hard fact of the human nature is it's very hard for us to let go and forget sin. And even if we forgive it, like those words can haunt you, those negative words. That's what that psychology, uh, those studies have shown. It's just so hard to get that negative reinforcement out of our brain. And so if you're in that tight relationship and your spouse says something that is right at your inner character and something you're either proud or embarrassed about, it can haunt you. Um, so just realizing the power of that, that's the reason I say that just like James here. It's just like, just be aware. Um, what you might say in an argument in a moment could be something that could last a lifetime. And so step away, calm down, use your words carefully. <laughs> right. <clears throat> yeah, and so... Even with Jesus, too, like you were saying, there's a lot of times where he doesn't answer somebody's question or he answers their question with a shorter question. All to, because he is the, the great teacher, all to help that person better understand where they're coming from. And often then it exposes their misunderstanding, wrong attitude, their sin, whatever it is. And then he's able to heal them. Uh, and so, yeah, being a master teacher to help other people use their words uh, better is, is a big thing. And yeah, so teaching, we can all teach. We can all teach each other and we can all learn to better speak and then all comes from being in the word and being taught by God. So. Absolutely. And all right, I'll read the next section. So James chapter three, <clears throat> it's verses nine through 12. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and father. And with it, we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? Which is a rhetorical question. My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grape vine bear frigs? Again, he's like, obvious answer would be no, guys. That's not how it works. Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. And so the commentary, words are also God's means to rescue people from hell. A sermon, a Bible study, a catechism lesson, or an evangelism visit over coffee all look tame and ineffectual. But God's power to save people, to create and sustain saving faith, rides with words. And so believability of the church's word its people and teachers will have an enormous impact on the believability of the church's message. It is vitally important for all Christians, all Christians, especially for those who speak in the church's name to let their faith control their words. People hate hypocrisy, and they sense it. And if they don't sense it right away, if they have been led by a hypocrite for a long time and then do discover it, it is just crushing. And so double-minded Christians with forked tongues, praising God and cursing one another, drive people away from the Savior. James will not let Christians get comfortable with that double standard. Springs don't yield fresh water and salt water. 
Fig trees don't bear olives. Rape vines don't bear figs. Christ-like minds and Christ-like hearts direct the mouth to utter Christ-like words. That's the commentary. My wife once said to me, and it was after a certain sermon that she was like, that was awesome. And uh, my wife is very supportive, and I appreciate her to death for being supportive and not critical to me when I preach a sermon like that. Honestly, it means it means the world to me. Uh, and so far, I genuinely believe she's not being hypocritical when she does that. She genuinely believes that. But one of these sermons I told like a really in-depth story. I had just read a book about the power of stories and how that can convey truth in a powerful way. And so I told the story. And so much so that uh, my wife, when it was done, she's like, wow, that was just kind of amazing at how you wove that story and brought us into a different place and a different perspective through that story. And my wife's comment was like, man, now I want to go preach a sermon. And I loved that comment. Like that was just, for me, it was really exciting. But her point was like, it was a demonstration of how powerful a 10, 15, and let's be honest with my sermons, it was probably 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> 20 minutes can affect someone's life. Like, just think about that. Like simple words could change the trajectory of someone's life. And think back on your life. If there was someone like a mentor who came in and had a tough conversation with you, but that's been a conversation that has echoed through out the years and has changed your behavior. That was words. And those are just human words. Now think about like when you're adding God's word to the mix, or you're adding his power because the spirit is working through those words, how powerful words are. And James is concerned, especially as Christians, that like if we have God's word in us and we're charged to speak God's word, but we're also sinful human beings who have our own tongues in our own minds and we are not always perfect, that if we're not being actively conscious about that, we could very easily give a mixed message, which without even trying, we are going to. Let's just be honest. We are sinful human beings. We are going to say stupid things and we're going to make mistakes. But when he's saying it here and take James this way, he's like, He's trying to get the Christians who are listening to stop just like being okay with being lazy and thinking about their faith and how to practice their faith. So he's saying, don't just be like, okay, I'm a human. I make mistakes. It's no big deal. It's going to happen. And then you just go on to speak very belligerently and you don't put any active effort into changing your behavior. God will forgive it anyways. This is what James hates. So he's saying like, don't just like go into church praise God, sing the hymns, do the confession, and then walk out the doors, get in the car, and start cursing and swearing at your wife and kids. You know, like, that needs to follow you. You need to have consistency of character. When you tell God you're sorry, and you hear that you're forgiven, and you say that you appreciate it. You say a prayer at the end and say, thank you, Lord, for giving me your words to open my mind and to teach me your truths. Help me to obey your commands. And then you walk out and you don't put one ounce of effort into that promise you just made. That's an issue. <laughs> he said, that's a hypocritical person. That is someone who is practicing unbelief. I'm not saying you're an unbeliever yet, but you are practicing unbelief by your behavior. And when you practice unbelief by your behavior, you are on a fast track to become an unbeliever. This is what pastors are very concerned about when they talk. Like there's a difference between like incidental mistakes or like you, um, or let's just say in a rage or in a moment, you make some terrible mistakes. It was intentional. It was bad, but it was more of a one-time like bad moment. And you come you come to Jesus and you like confess your sins you come back and you say you're sorry then there's like 
you know, that's its own issue. You deal with it in isolation. But then when something becomes habitual, when something is re repetitious, when it is um, ingrained, when it's a lifestyle, this is where it's like, it's not that the other sin wasn't dangerous, but now you're compounding the danger because you keep on doing it. You keep on doing it and you don't even take it serious anymore because you've done it so much. It just becomes part of who you are. And that sin, that constant choice to do the opposite of what God says, or lack of choice to intentionally tackle it or take it seriously, is practicing a disregard for God's voice, a disrespect for him. It's very, um, you just don't take God's love seriously. You don't take the cross seriously. And that's why like pastors, when there's like a habitual thing or a lifestyle thing, I mean, this is why lifestyle sins are big. Like if you're choosing a lifestyle that goes counter to the Bible, you are practicing putting your will above God's and that will lead you down the path of unbelief. And that's why James couldn't say it strongly. Um, couldn't um, yeah, say this any weaker. He, he says like out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing my brothers. This should not be. This is what the world hates to see too. When a Christian goes to church and then they go out in their community and they see the type of person they are and they wonder to themselves, I don't want to go to his church because if that's the type of Christians they're making, I want nothing to do with it. Um, so just picture it from the outside looking in too. And James is saying very practically, if you're like that and you're practicing a negative behavior, you're running towards sin, you can't. You can't produce the right fruit. <laughs> He's like, um, yeah, if you're constantly spitting out all of this stuff with your tongue that's negative, you can't then just turn a dial and be this positive, wonderful person. You might say that out loud. You might pretend to be. You might be very good at being superficial and manipulating people, but your character is wrong. You are sick on the inside and maybe even more sick if you could actually pull that off and convince people that's kind of scary cuz now you're uh, you know that's that's like what serial killers do and you don't want to be a serial killer <laughs> so uh, just heavy warnings and we'll talk about gospel in a second but I'm going to let Gunnar comment on some of the seriousness of the law side of this yeah he gets it i in counseling people, I point him to James so often because he is so direct. Like, he speaks the truth in love. Uh, he's full of grace and truth, which is what's also said of Jesus. And again, at the end of the day, you know, when you're talking with someone, and we offer pastoral counseling, we're not licensed counselors as pastors. I mean, some are, but neither of us are. So my counseling for you really is to direct you either to see and hear God's law or to hear his gospel. And James here, point blank, says, with your words, if you praise God, but then curse others, there is no middle ground. He says, you are salt water. It don't That's, taste good. <laughs> right. Yeah. You are a salt water, period. There's no... That's the end of this, is you you cannot have fresh and salt water. And so his point is, right, the thing that crushes us, uh, when you hear this and the Holy Spirit works it on your heart, is he says, so you are salt water. And you reference those verses before, he says, so you are in the fire of hell. And that's where he leaves you. Um, and that's what crushes uh, your soul and brings you to that humility that you can't help but uh, seek God because he's the only one who can forgive. And that's, you know, that's one thing. But then you have so if you think about this in terms of uh, some Christian 
religious church bodies or Christian teachers or pastors or Christian leaders or even down to just two Christians talking or Christian friends. If, again, any one of those talks about all the things that Jesus has done and talks all about Jesus and his forgiveness, his life, his death, his healings, his miracles, his love, his greatness, all that, and then says, so, um, you know, if you want that, if you see the need for that in your life, then accept him. Then decide to follow him. Then show your obedience. You have destroyed everything. And that happens so often, uh, not just in this country, but other countries it's happened throughout history. Uh, it's what Paul lays into Galatians. He addresses it in Colossians. It's all these places. It's Jesus' conversations with the Pharisees. It's all these things, but it's your words as a Christian to others must be law and gospel. Uh, but often... Uh, like you were saying, you know, with lifestyles, we either only speak law and then say we're speaking gospel, really it's just more law, or we just speak gospel and never cut anyone to the heart and we allow them to continue to live in sin, uh, which destroys faith and honestly, a lot of times probably means there never is faith. But so when you talk to someone about all that Jesus has done, you leave it at Jesus <laughs> has done all of this for us. Uh, when you bring in, yeah, so now you need to like make your decision or choose to do all these things for him. All you've done is left a person in the law. Like you have to do something in order to be saved, which crushes people. Uh, and then they're not saved, right? Because you just left them with the crushing law and they just go off depressed and really hating God because they're like, well, this God is stupid and this religion is stupid because I can't do it. Or you leave them filled with pride um, that they're now going to dedicate their lives and work towards this, which doesn't work. And, you know, when they have mishaps or, you know, backsliding is what you hear a lot. And they're like, well, I'll just rededicate my life and I'll get baptized again and I'll just come up to the altar again. And that's foolishness because you just see them killing themselves to work at something that they cannot do. And so that's where you have uh, just this destruction because you only leave someone in the law. And then when you just have the gospel and you just say, well, whatever, God just loves everybody. Like Jesus was here and he accepted all people and he ate with sinners. And so just, you know, regardless of who you are, how you live your life, God just loves you. And so don't worry about it. Well, then you have not used the law and you have not used the gospel either because law and gospel go together. And so you destroy people by allowing them to love and embrace sin and never love their savior. And Jesus simply becomes this, you know, affirming buddy that really doesn't care what you do. And God, in a sense, becomes this, you know, grandpa for everybody, this good old boy up in heaven that just winks or doesn't care how you live as long as you're happy uh, and living by your sinful nature. But that's the... That's the destruction and the hypocrisy. That's an application of what hypocrisy and all that can do. And yeah, and you're giving a, just a good example of, I mean, if you're listening to that and you're like, wow, I can barely wrap my head around what Gunnar is saying there because it's hard to track, but you're like, because law and gospel is tricky. Right. It is tricky to balance this appropriately. Um, and it can feel very defeating sometimes when it's just like, you're, you know, like... You know, James is saying here, like, don't do this. Um, but you, 
we also recognize like because of our sin, we're always going to struggle to not do that. And that's very defeating. You know, that can leave you and just like, so what's the point? Mm -hmm. But this is what we are and what we're not saying and what God is saying. He's saying like, don't just sit there and like throw up your hands and being like, it's useless and there's no point. I might as well just, you know, it doesn't matter what I do. I might as well just not do anything. No, he's just saying, let's, let's do this seriously. So first, like, let's seriously embrace the fact that I'm a sinner. I'm messing up. And that's a serious thing because I have a real God who is righteous and he hates it. And he had to pay dearly to pay for every single sin. And that that's a big deal to me. So I'm going to take this to task. I'm going to consciously think about this. I'm going to confess my sin and I am going to honestly strive not to do this. However, then we come to the beautiful gospel. And here's the thing, like God has forgiven my sin. As soon as I turn to him for mercy, he takes it away. Not because of my goodness, not because I'm what I'm going to do tomorrow, not because of my, um, even my resolve, my willpower, um, this is simply by the grace of God, I have been forgiven. I am I am hearing a fact and the spirit helps me cling to that fact and believe it. And it is also the spirit then who can and will work in us to attack these hypocritical things that we can do when we're living in the flesh, when we are just letting go and letting our sinful nature take control. Instead, what God does promise is as we love Jesus and what he has done for us, we appreciate that we are saved. Um, that inspires a change of behavior. And there is power there in the words of God to inspire a different lifestyle. This is that new creation, this new life. But again, this is not out of pride. This is not to earn salvation. It's already been done. This is motivated by that. And out of that, yes, can come new fruit. Like Jesus says, if you are in me, you will bear much fruit. You will bear much fruit. This is something that can happen, but it happens by God's grace. And you see that when people acknowledge very willingly, like they do something awesome and they're like, yep, because God gave me the ability. He's been with me or he's blessed me so much. I cannot help but want to serve him. And I know people could lie about that, but like when you see genuine compassion and faith expressed that way, it's beautiful. And when you are able to do that personally and you know it's coming from that place, like it is an amazing feeling to appreciate and love the love of God. Absolutely. <clears throat> but like you were saying too, it makes me think of two illustrations. <clears throat> the you know, if you have a maybe a mom or lady that's uh, or someone that's worked all day um, on the house with the kids and uh, you know made dinner too or something like that and you come home and uh, if your first words are you know, why does the house look like this? Or, uh, I don't really want this for dinner. You've just crushed someone's spirit, right? Uh, or if you have someone who's worked all day, whether at their job or worked all day on maybe like a honey to-do list or something like that, and you know, it's a project that, you know, maybe HGTV said would take 22 minutes. Uh, but for <laughs> you, it's taken nine hours and more money. And more or an IKEA stuff. package. Yeah, like, an Ikea, and Ikea package. So many Allen wrenches. Yeah, 4,000 Allen wrenches. Exactly. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and you had to do it at home. So afterwards, you couldn't go get an ice cream or meatballs. You just, it was not done. And, you know, spouse comes in and says, well, it doesn't look like the picture. I mean, then you really see just the destruction there. Whereas if in the first scenario you come home and you're like, man, the house looks good. And uh, man, this meal is good. And if the other person's like, well, 
no, the house is still messy and yeah, I wish I could have made something else. But if you go, no, this is good. Like that's everything. And with the other one, uh, you know, wow, this looks great. Like, can't believe you finished this. Like, oh, there's no way I could have done this. And the person's like, well, it doesn't look like the picture on the box. And it doesn't. And the person's like, no, uh, I appreciate your time. And, uh, you know, this is going to serve our family or whatever. Like, those things are just huge. And, uh, you know, we can all relate to those kinds of things. And so it's it's that maturity of faith to pause and understand um And it's not to do lies or deceptions, it's to recognize what the true reality is, that the reality is that person showed love by doing all these things, and so they, we ought to show them love back and erase the judgmental, uh, you know, totally wrong, selfish expectations that we have in our mind. Uh, but simply give thanks and love other people. And so, but the heart behind those words that can do that in the moment and be ready to share good words only, like you said, comes from being filled with the spirit. So, yeah, one trained on him. Right. So, which lots of appropriate warnings by James. Uh, now he gets into the wisdom to do this in these last verses of chapter 3 so it's this James chapter 3 verses 13 through 18 it says who is wise and understanding among you let him show it by his good life by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts do not boast about it or deny the truth such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder in every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. So that's the word, now the commentary. James has been hammering on phony faith, and now he directs his criticism at phony wisdom. Apparently, what he was seeing and hearing from the scattered Christian synagogues was not good. Some people were setting themselves up as the wise and the learned. Perhaps because they knew a lot of historical facts, they could quote many Bible passages, they had lots of books, they knew lots of theories, and in short, could really talk the talk. But if that theoretical wisdom is yielding a life full of bitterness, envy, and selfish ambition, it is no wisdom at all, but pompous gas. It is not heaven-bound, but earth-bound, not of God, but of Satan, not of the spirit, but unspiritual. When a teacher is truly wise, it shows in good deeds and in humility. Bitter, envious, selfish, ambitious leaders grow a crop of bitter, envious, selfish, ambitious students. This results in disorder and every kind of evil deed. Truly wise teachers are pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, merciful, impartial, and sincere. And that kind of leadership and teaching bears a wonderful harvest. Many more new Christians were like that. And that's the commentary. So James started this section. Um, he is talking to the regular members in the congregation, but he started by saying specifically those who want to teach. So he's kind of saying like, those of you that want to stand up and, and have some influence um, be influencers in this congregation and impact other people. Better take a good hard look at your tongue and how you, you, you use your words and and do some do some serious study and preparation there. And now he's shifting to the wisdom behind that. So like, what's your motivation? You know, if you want to be a teacher, if you want to be someone who impacts other people, you want to be influential. What is your reason? And first he says, 
here, there's a right way and a wrong way. Some examples he gives of the wrong way or what it'll look like is you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart. So just for a second, I'm trying to picture what that would look like. Like if I would see bitter envy in a leader or someone who wants influence, they would get very frustrated at anyone else who is stealing the spotlight. They would get very mad if someone disagrees with them. They get louder in a situation um, when someone questions or brings up a fact that doesn't fit the narrative. Um, yeah, I've seen that. <laughs> um, I've embodied that. You know, it's just really easy to get that way. And so he's saying like, yeah, if it looks like that, or you can tell there's selfish ambition. So think about that. Like America's big about ambition. I actually, yeah, recently, I thank God when I have ambition to work, to work on ideas, to be with my kids, to have, you know, so ambition itself is not bad to have the gumption to get up and do things and to be motivated for success, for growing your business, for being successful. Like that's not bad at all. It's saying here. So when it becomes selfish is when you are just thinking about yourself or you are placing yourself over other people around you. That's selfish ambition. It's like so that I get ahead at the expense of others so that I have this and they don't. It's so that I have everything I need, but I'm not really considering the needs of the people around me in my community. That's selfish ambition. So you're saying if you see leaders that like they want to be in that position because it makes them feel good. And when this comes into the modern context, if you want to be an influencer on YouTube, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, whatever, you spend so much time doing it and you do it because you want people to like you, you want people to follow you, you want to be somebody, um, you want money. Yeah, you want to make money through those things. Like, and it making money is not wrong, but if it's about like the feel good part of it, where this is part of your identity, like that's it's selfish. Are you, are you? One good question to ask as a Christian leader or as a Christian business person or as a Christian representative is, am I doing this to serve others? Am I doing this to help them see Jesus? Or am I doing this simply to pad my own ego? Okay, so that's like negative examples. On the positive, though, he gives some really cool examples here. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is, first of all, pure peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Again, I would challenge you to just think about your life and think about the mentors or the people that you look up to the most. Is it leaders from the first group or is it leaders from the second group? Chances are it was a quiet, kind, very humble person who spoke the right words at the right time. And even though they had every right to lord it over you or to ignore you, they spent serious time with you because they saw value in you. Um, they wanted to invest in you. They were considerate. They were submissive in the sense that they like treated your opinion as high as theirs, which was very uplifting. Um, so again, when you think about those examples, it's obvious. Now... Let's take a step back and think about the gospel, how cool this is. Because Jesus, who had every reason to lord it over everybody, every reason to come to earth and being like, all of you guys are jerks. Like, you've been abusing my father since the beginning. You've been just totally um, running the opposite direction and all about yourself. Instead, he comes with kindness, with every single one of these qualities. He was pure, peace-loving considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. And he sowed a huge harvest of righteousness. I mean, this applies to Jesus to the nth degree. You think of Philippians 2, where it talks about Jesus becoming so humble, uh, making himself even willing to be obedient to death, even death on a cross. And in that section, after describing the type of person Jesus was for us and how he saved us by being this perfect leader, this servant leader, it says in the same way, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. 
same point point James is making here. If you want to have true wisdom, imitate Jesus. But before that, be inspired by him, be empowered by him, be saved by him, because he is the one who has done this perfectly. He has filled you with everything you need. And as you grow closer to him, like we've said multiple times today, you are able to embody that in your character as well. All this, like you said, comes from heaven. And like James says, right, you've got earthly wisdom and heavenly wisdom. And the heart that is consumed by earthly wisdom is selfish and envious. And so it, it wants what other people have. It wants to be above and better than other people. Uh, again, just for building your own personal kingdom, life, influence, power, whatever it is. And so, yeah, and like you said, it's the, the Bible is very clear. It's the love of money. Uh, it's the root of all kinds of evil, not money itself, but the love of it. So it's all attitude and heart. And that's the distinction that James makes through all of this. And he focuses a lot on words and the tongue because that is a window into someone's heart and mind. So we can't read someone's mind. We can't see someone's heart. We can't see their faith, uh, but you hear it. And that's how you can tell uh, where someone's at. And you can match their words with how they live to confirm that. And that's James is all about that. And so he says, when you see someone has wisdom from above, you can see a heart of humility. Instead of selfishness, it's selflessness. Instead of envy, it's gratitude and wanting to share. That's why there's purity. That's why there's peacemaking. That's why there's submission. And the way that happens is uh, from above. And so it has to be God's spirit working on your heart, which he does through the word uh, it's a reminder of what your baptism meant for you and still means for you. Like when Jesus talked with Nicodemus, he says, you were, we've all been born of flesh. So sinful flesh, our parents, uh, born worldly, unbelieving, not following, uh, born selfish. But we all need is to be born of the spirit, to be reborn and, uh, the Greek there that is often translated born again, the word again is actually two Greek words from above. So really it's you need to be born from above. And so recognizing that at your baptism, whether it was yesterday or decades ago, its effects are still working on you because it's something God did for you. Again, not something you did for God. And so you continue to live as his person uh, one of his children and the Lord's Supper continues to forgive you and fill you up uh, with God's forgiveness. Uh, and it is the strength uh, to continue to get you through this life in your spirit. And so all of this comes, this wisdom from above and humility comes from God. And so if you, uh, as we all struggle with this, the way to have that wisdom to live out this life, to use our tongues and our words properly. It doesn't come from working really hard on it uh, or meditating or all these kinds of things, but it comes from God. And then he's the one that allows you to work these things out, to speak this way. So as we struggle yes. with this, we all run to Christ and his forgiveness. And then in his forgiveness... Uh, we can't help but live this way. Yeah, you find that perfect power. So if it does feel deflating to hear like, yeah, you're never going to be able to perfectly handle your demons or fight these things. This is all natural and it happens to all of us. Yeah, that should be a bit deflating because that is saying you and your human nature are incapable of doing these things. However, this is the beauty of faith. Something apart from you, something outside of you has come to dwell in you. This is the born again part. This is the born from heaven. This is what Jesus was trying to teach Nicodemus, who was a teacher of teachers. 
and yet was struggling to share true spiritual life. And he says, you need to be born again. And he's like, how can I do that? That doesn't make any sense. And he's like, born of the water and of the spirit. Um, it is a miraculous thing. It's something that comes from heaven, not from you. Duh. Like, that's where the power comes from. And then, yes, you will look more and more like Christ. You will be able to do these things. You will be able to fight this fight. And yet it's not you, it's Christ in you. That's the difference. You can't take credit for it. It is God working in you. And God has the power to do these things. God can change you. God can make you amazing. God can help you not be a hypocrite. God can help you even when you're struggling and it's you know a mixed message. He can help the gospel message carry through to the person, people around you so that they may see Christ and not your failures. Or if they do see your failures, they see God's grace still. Despite those failures, continue to love you and empower you to go out and be a representative for him, which can be a very powerful witness. Mm. Yes. Amen. Hmm. Good section. Awesome to finish James 3. He's got so many good things to say, and we still got two more chapters to go. So I look forward to keep walking through this with you. I hope this was a benefit to you. Um, can I say a prayer, Gunner? Yes. Can I leave you some spirit to take you on your way wherever you are? Mm -hmm. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for sending your son to die for us, to take away all of our sin, to pay for all of the inconsistencies in our character and the way we talk, for all of the harsh words that we have said to others and all of the inappropriate things we have said um, that have implied you are not our number one, that more than that have shown that in our heart you are not in number one place. And we, we ask you for forgiveness. Please forgive all of those careless words all of those times where we were unwise, we were selfish, and we were all about envy. Please, as you take all of that away, don't just leave a void in our heart, but do exactly as you promised. Fill us with your love and your power by your Holy Spirit who connects us to Jesus Christ and all that he won for us on the cross and gives to us um, through the empty grave. Help us draw power from you, our God, who does everything for us and promises to pour into us heavenly wisdom and heavenly words. Help us to make it a priority to set aside time in the day to be charged by this as we study your word, as we pray, as we listen to podcasts like this, as we um, take time to be in church and in worship where we can sing your praises more and more. Um, and through all of that, help us be this powered up Christian to go out and display your glory in us and to the world. We pray all this in your name, and we know that you hear us. Amen. Amen.